time and ran out of time. Um, sorry about that. I wasn't paying attention to the clock like I usually do. <clears throat> so, you know, this, this is the typical um, scenario of, for potassium control. And that is in the distal part of the nephron, we have these pumps that are sensitive to aldosterone. And what I mean by that is when aldosterone is present, these pumps are present and function. When aldosterone is absent, these pumps are absent. So sodium uh, retention and potassium excretion is controllable by controlling the number of these pumps that are functioning in this purple part of the nephron here. Okay, so they do both things. They reduce sodium loss and they increase potassium secretion. All right. Now, another quirky thing with these pumps is they are pH dependent. When there are too many hydrogen ions around, okay, so that means the pH is too low, right, when the pH is low, these pumps shift from pumping out potassium to pumping out hydrogen ions instead. Now, this is an example of the body, um, you know, ev shoot, or evolution selecting for the most problematic thing first. In other words, the bigger problem for the patient or the organism is too high of a hydrogen ion concentration, a pH that's too low. That's going to kill you fastest, right? Too low of a potassium or too high of a potassium is going to get you too, but this one's going to get you earlier. So the first, the bigger problem is dealt with preferentially. So in the case of a patient who is what we call acidotic, in other words, their pH is lower than normal, these pumps in the nephron are going to pump out hydrogen ions instead of potassium ions. Now, that seems like a good idea, but it creates this connection between high potassium levels and acidosis, or um, a pH that's too low. So, and this does come up in taking care of patients. So you've got, let's say, a diabetic patient, and their pH is 7. You know, normal pH is 7.4. Well, their kidneys are going to dump hydrogen ions instead of potassium, which means that their potassium level is going to have a tendency to go up and up and up because it's not being secreted like it usually is. So what we oftentimes see is we see that um, when there is acidemia or a pH that's too low, there is also hyperkalemia. So the two kind of go together. And it's an important thing to remember. Now, in the modern day, when it's so easy for us to order labs on patients, we usually pick this up anyway because we're, we look at potassium levels all the time. Um, but in the patient who's acidotic, their uh, potassium levels can get high because of this effect. All right. So why do we care about potassium disturbances in the first place? It's because our tolerance for potassium derangement is pretty small. So the normal potassium range, as you see there, is 3.5 to 5.5. The number... Um, I have in my head is four, you know, some people like a range, some people like to remember the middle, and then you can go and calculate it or think about it that way. <clears throat> anything below um, two or anything above really six, and you're into abnormal ranges, and both are problematic. Both hypokalemia and hyperkalemia affect the heart muscle, particularly its rhythmicity. You know, the conducting system that we learned about earlier this semester? Well, it's dependent upon action potential. And action potential is dependent upon membrane potential, which is dependent upon potassium levels, right? Going all the way back to last semester when we talked about membrane potential. So <clears throat> both too high here and too low are problematic, and the heart is one of the principal um, concerns. Now, there's other things, too, you know, in um, we get muscle weakness that develops, neurologic impairment, and it's all because of potassium's effect on membrane potential. When the potassium level is screwed up, the membrane potentials are messed up, and cells that depend on those start to do funny things, like send a contraction signal when they shouldn't, or not respond to a contraction signal when they should. So we get both of those things. So what gets you into these cases? Rarely is it dietary. You know, oftentimes, uh, you know, levels of nutrients, we think, oh, they're not getting enough potassium in their diet, or they're getting too much. That is rarely the case. 
it is usually something else that's causing the potassium problem in the first place. So <clears throat> hypokalemia, a number of the diuretics that we use, particularly Lasix, um, <clears throat> tricks the kidney into producing extra urine, but it does so by increasing potassium secretion. So you get the case where, yes, you're getting a lot of urine output out of the patient, but their potassium level is falling all the time, too. Um, you'll learn all about Lasix and its many problems and its many wonders. It's a great medicine, but you have to know how to use it um, in further classes, right? Um, another cause for hypokalemia um, is directly as a result of too much aldosterone being secreted. This does happen. It's a case called aldosteronism. Now, this is pretty uncommon but it does show you the effect of aldosterone. If you give too much aldosterone to a patient or if they make too much aldosterone, right over there you see it increases in potassium excretion, which is gonna drop the potassium level in the patient, right? <clears throat> All told, hyperkalemia comes up much, much more often than hypokalemia does, with the exception of the diuretic effect, all right? So what gets you up here? Um, well, a, a, a acidosis hand, just like we talked about, and acidosis is very common. In other words, a decrease in the body's pH can be caused by a number of different reasons. We're going to talk about some of those um, as we get further on here. So we have that. Um, kidney failure, one of the things that gets people going to dialysis as often as they do is their potassium level goes up and up and up. They go to dialysis, it falls to normal range, and then they leave dialysis, and it goes up and up and up, and repeat and repeat and repeat. So kidneys that don't work properly, one of the ways you, or one of the things you see is that potassium builds up in the body. Um, and then finally, medications again. There are, again, a number of medications that work on the kidney that can alter potassium excretion, in other words, opposite of Lasix. Um, and cause potassium levels to go up. <clears throat> so we worry about potassium levels, and we get so many labs on patients that we look at potassium levels a lot. Now, here comes the problem and the sort of public service announcement for your future. The potassium levels are notorious for being inaccurate, and the reason for that is the, something you learned early on, which is where is potassium in the body? So here's cells, here's a cell, potassium, lots of potassium inside of cells, very little potassium outside of cells. So we get our needle out and our syringe and we stick the needle in the blood vessel and we pull it out. Well, what did we pull out? Well, we pulled out blood cells and plasma at the same time, right? So <clears throat> because we've got the mixture, we've got blood and at the same time. Well, what comes next? Well, you send that vial to the lab and they spin it down so they try to separate these red cells from the plasma. Okay, and then it's the plasma, it's potassium concentration, that's the normal range there. That's what we want to measure is the potassium in the plasma. <clears throat> so that's, in a perfect world, that's exactly how it works. All the red cells get pushed out of the plasma and they measure only the potassium that we took out of the patient in the plasma, not in the red cells. Now, welcome to the real world, okay? It's not always easy to get blood out of a patient. Many of you have had a failed needle stick or two, right? Somebody's trying to take blood from you and they can't. Well, <clears throat> there's that process. It, the blood sample takes its little journey, right, from the patient to the lab to the different parts of the lab. All of those things can take time. All of those things involve jostling and moving, <clears throat> any one of which can break these red blood cells. So either when you pull the blood out of the patient, when you put it in the tube, when you move that tube around the system, or just by letting it sit there for an hour, these red cells start to pop. Now, when they pop, their potassium leaks out, right? So we call that hemolysis. So hemolysis. Or the breaking of blood cells. Happens all the time. It happens when we try to pull a lab out through an IV cord, for example, or you know, lots of reasons for hemolysis. Every red cell that breaks before that 
serum potassium, that plasma potassium is measured, artificially elevates this level. Okay? So let's say you've got a six-month-old, and it was really difficult to get that little bit of blood out. You know, so you had to prick the finger and sort of scoop it out. Well, you're going to have a lot of hemolysis. So then the blood comes back, and the potassium is 10. And everybody panics. Oh my gosh, this kid's going to die, right? Because high potassium causes things like cardiac arrhythmias. Well, the child's actual serum potassium is normal. But what happened in the process of determining that level, we had a lot of hemolysis, this intracellular potassium leaked out, got into here, then we measured it here, but it really belonged here. Does that kind of make sense? So in the course of your taking care of patients, many, many, many times you're going to get a call with a high potassium level from a routine lab. Okay. So you have a choice to make as a, as a clinical decision maker. First thing you think is, is it really possible that this patient has a potassium problem? And if the answer is no, then just forget about it. It's hemolysis, right? It's a lab error. Well, the lab didn't make an error. The, the cells broke open. Because this is what the lab measured. It's not like they made a mistake. It's just what they measured wasn't accurate for the model that, that the normal range is geared to. Or if you think, okay, maybe this patient could have a potassium problem. Well, you have to repeat the lab. And particularly for new um, uh, healthcare providers in that stream, in other words, whoever's drawing the blood, who's ever handling the blood, sometimes you have to educate that with potassium levels in particular, every step of that process has to be done very carefully, right? So the blood has to be drawn carefully. That tube should go right to the lab. You know, do not pass go, do not stop and chat, go right to the lab and drop it off. Uh, and then oftentimes what you see is the repeat then, done really well, will be, you know, four and a half, you know, something very normal. Because um, what we want to avoid is, if, if this is false, and we treat this patient for a high potassium, you're going to drive them down here instead. Right? You're going to drop their potassium below normal, and then you're going to have problems there, too. So a little life lesson well in advance to actually needing it. You'll learn this. All of you who take care, take care of patients will. Potassium can be kind of a nightmare. <laughs> right? So um, potassium and its fun in the real world. Okay. Um, you have other choices, too. Always, 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 when you get a lab on a patient that's abnormal, go look at the patient. Right? Because oftentimes labs don't play the whole story. If this patient's potassium was really 10, they would have cardiac arrhythmias already. So you can go and you can look at their EKG monitor and say, well, this can't be right, it can't be 10. You know, and make your decisions that way. Okay. Moving on. Potassium disturbances. Okay. We'll just do the questions by hand because I just can't have a good thing here. Aldosterone does what? Okay, are you breathing? Aldosterone. Which of those do you think? E, very good. Because why is it not C? What does aldosterone do? Increases blood pressure. Because it causes sodium retention, which causes water retention. So, but A and B for sure. All right. Okay. So, three topics in this chapter, right? Fluid balance, electrolyte balance, and acid-base balance. The first two are sort of related, okay? Because fluid and salt go together. Hopefully you've gotten that by right now. The rest of this chapter is about acid-base balance. And to give you a little context, <clears throat> acid-base balance is... A, a final common endpoint, or problems with acid-base balance, is a final common endpoint to lots and lots of illnesses. Okay? Many disorders result in acidosis in particular. And when the pH of the patient starts to fall, the whole system shuts down, starts to shut down. Because all of our body's enzymes are very pH sensitive. So we're very sensitive to this. And ultimately, your, your pH at any given time is determined by the things in this diagram here. 
Okay, so one is that your cells themselves. We produce acid. Okay, we produce carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide all by itself has a tendency to produce acid in water because of that carbonic acid equation, which I'm going to show you in a minute. But our cells also produce hydrogen ions from other reasons, uh, too. So our metabolism produces hydrogen ions. Okay, so that's the source. Then we have two exits for that um, acid. We have the lungs, which get rid of CO2, CO2 being a principal source of um, hydrogen ions in the body. And then the kidneys also directly get rid of hydrogen ions, as well as the molecules that make them. You know, from chemistry, you remember, an acid is a molecule that tends to give up a hydrogen ion into solution, right? A hydrogen donor. So the kidney gets rid of not only the hydrogen ion that creates pH in the first place, but the kidney also gets rid of the molecules that make acids as well, um, the, the acids themselves. And then in between, we have the blood, normal blood pH, 7.35, 7.45. These numbers are worth memorizing, are worth knowing. Right? So you can either think of it as a range or think 7.4 plus or minus 0.05 is how I think of it. And that is remarkably consistent across individuals. You know, most measures in the body vary from person to person. pH doesn't vary by very much. Okay, so like in this room, the, the average pH is going to be about 7.4. And the variation is not going to be more than uh, plus or minus 0.02 or 3. So it's a tiny little variation. This is something we're all very consistent about. <clears throat> now, there's one more, more complicated player in this here. So this is production. This is excretion. Well, you remember how when we talked about oxygen and carbon dioxide, how they have to be carried from one place to another, from where they're produced or gathered to where they're used up? Well, hydrogen ions have to be carried too. And the carrying system are buffers. Who's never heard of a buffer? Good. See, I love advanced CAP because there's no hands raised, which makes things so much easier. Because buffers are very complicated in chemistry for some, but you all are going to get it very easily. We have a number of buffer systems in our body that work to carry, this is how I think of it, and it carries these hydrogen ions from where they're produced to where they're um, gotten rid of, so that the body's pH can stay rock solid the same, even though acid production and elimination can vary according to whatever the body's doing. You know, so for example, in, uh, in exercise, particularly anaerobic exercise, our hydrogen ion production goes way up, but because we have really vigorous buffer systems, your pH doesn't change, you know, even when you're, um, uh, maximally exercising in the anaerobic, you're making a ton of lactic acid, your pH doesn't drop by much because of all these buffers. Okay, so if acid's a big deal, we should know, well, where do they come from? And there's three different types here. The fixed acids are um, acids that don't leave solution. In other words, once they're produced, they, they, are, they stay. These are the acids that you probably learned about in chemistry first. So this is like phosphoric acid, sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid falls into this category too. In other words, once you put the HCl into the water, you can't put it back together again into HCl. It's going to be hydrogen ion and chloride ion. That's it. So the fixed acids, we don't make very much of these, but the only way to get rid of them is by the kidney. So there's not another option here. Um, so, and, uh, so, for example, hydrochloric acid, we produce a little bit of that, and the kidney has to get rid of those hydrogen ions and chloride ions directly. There's no other path for that. Okay, so those are the fixed acids. The, we're going to come back to this one. The volatile acids, there's really only one that matters, and that's carbonic acid. Okay, so the chemical equation that I've asked you to know in the class, here it comes again. I'm going to write it because I'll be referring to it both today and Monday. <clears throat> that is, we take H2O, which is always around, CO2, which we make a ton of, 
We put those together to make H2CO3. This is carbonic acid. And the enzyme that makes that is called CA carbonic anhydrase. Okay. And this carbonic acid is intrinsically unstable. Okay, so it doesn't stay like this. It's, it goes to H plus plus HCO3 points, right? So <clears throat> um, carbonic anhydrase can go both ways here. And carbonic acid, you can only have carbonic acid in a solution that's under pressure. You know, so like in a closed soda bottle, you have quite a bit of carbonic acid. But as soon as you open that soda bottle, you get this instead. The CO2 comes out um, and the water stays behind. These two are always in equilibrium. So carbonic acid is always in equilibrium with hydrogen ion and bicarbonate. This is bicarbonate. So because we produce this, and because water is always around, we produce this. This is the volatile acid. Volatility, you remember, that just means it can go into a gas. It can gas away. And in this case, it's volatile because under standard temperature and pressure, carbonic acid breaks down into CO2 and water, and in the CO2 we can breathe out. Okay. So remember I said it goes um, this way in the tissues. And it goes this way in the lungs. Okay, so it's reversible. Because what we're going to see probably um, either at the end of today or next time, um, this, which so far we've talked about this as a way to carry CO2 as bicarbonate, right? So that it, we can go back to the lungs and then it goes in reverse. But what we're going to see is that bicarbonate is also a buffer. And it's one of the most important buffers in the body because of this equation. Because we have these really cool structures called lungs, it means that bicarbonate we can make into CO2. And every time we do that, when we take a bicarbonate um, molecule and we blow off, we blow off the CO2, we lose one of these hydrogen ions too. You see that? Because in order to get a CO2, we have to add this hydrogen ion back on. So as long as we have bicarbonate, we can use our lungs to um, get rid of hydrogen ions. In other words, to um, raise our pH. And we make these anyway. We make hydrogen ions. So it's a path for getting rid of acid. More on that as we, count, as we go here. Okay, so that's this box. The metal box is the, the, a little bit more complicated. And these are the organic acids. These are acids that our body produces in different conditions or situations. Um, but typically, organic acids are not done being metabolized. So <clears throat> while we can get rid of organic acids through the kidneys, typically we destroy them instead. Okay, So instead of excreting lactic acid, for example, we take that lactic acid and we metabolize it and eventually break it down into CO2 instead. Now, in disease states, you will see organic acids being removed by the kidney, but that's usually not normal. Okay, so if you're seeing a, a patient who has a lot of organic acid in their system, it means there's some metabolic problem. Okay, so we see this in uh, diabetes is the most common place we see it. You also see it in what we call inborn errors of metabolism, where a baby is born without all of the metabolic steps intact, and you get acids that build up there. But these ones are usually metabolized into something else, either a fixed acid or CO2 or something else like urea, for example, um, where it gets removed by the kidney in a different form. Okay. And so why do we care? Well, because our acid range is pretty narrow. And unfortunately, they give you the whole pH range. It, outside of about 5.5 to 9.5, you're pretty much dead or on your way to death. <laughs> point. Okay, So 
the only pH that's really within survivable range is just this middle piece right here. Okay. Um, so anything below 7.0, we would consider that a severe acidosis. Um, anything above 8, we would consider a severe alkalosis. Now, acidosis is much more common than alkalosis is because we produce acids. You know, if we were base producers, alkalosis would be more common, but we're not. We tend to make acids anyway. You know, so what happens? Well, pretty much all the body systems shut down, but the central nervous system, we see effects there very early. The brain is very sensitive to everything. So, you know, the brain's the first thing that gets affected most of the time. Um, heart contraction and muscle contraction also start to fail at some point. A reduction in cardiac output actually decreases your pH, so you start to get into a spiral. You know, the heart starts to not work very well, which makes the pH even lower, which makes it not work even more, and it gets lower and lower and lower. There's several of those death spirals where the metabolism is basically uh, causing itself to become worse. Um, and then we get effects, you know, in the, in the uh, distal or the peripheral parts of the body too, like vasodilation, patients turn, they get very clammy and, and red, is it's a weird thing to see. Um, <clears throat> but those are all uh, advanced or severe acidosis. Anything below 7.35 though, we would consider abnormal. That's an acidemia, there's something going on. Um, now it may be transient from something the patient's doing, um, but it's, it's still not normal. So 7.45 and above is alkalemia. Anything above 8 um, would be alkalosis. Okay. So I, I note here that a change of even 0.2 is serious. So don't let the small numbers fool you. Um, typically in the hospital, when you get a pH level, and it's tricky, you can't just draw blood from a vein to get a pH, at least not an accurate one. Because by the time blood has gone through a capillary bed, it has absorbed a lot of um, hydrogen ions made by the cells. So that isn't technically the body's pH level. You have to get it out of an artery. So one of the reasons we do arterial blood draws is one, to look at the gases, CO2 and oxygen. Another is to look at the pH. So assessing a patient's pH is not as straightforward as their sodium, for example. Um, but when you get that level, they'll typically give you three or four digits. So it'll be 7.3524 or whatever. So even small changes matter. That's why they, they measure it so precisely. So acidosis is much more common than um, alkalosis. Okay. We talked a little bit about this in the respiratory chapter, that CO2 and pH, in other words, how much CO2 you have in your blood and, and what your pH is are directly related to each other. They're inversely proportional. So, if you increase your CO2 production, your pH will go down until your lungs catch up. If they can, you know, in the case of you're, you're pushing yourself past your usual exercise limit, let's say, your pH will actually go down and stay down. It's one of the causes of fatigue. You know, why can't you run as fast as you can forever? Well, your pH starts to fall and the brain says enough of that, right? We're not going to die running. So it stops and then your pH eventually comes back up as your lungs catch up. Okay, so <clears throat> we have, you know, and in both cases are true. When the CO2 goes up, the pH goes down. When the CO2 goes down, the pH goes up. So they're directly related. And you know why already. It's because of this equation here. The more CO2 you have, remember your equilibrium equations from chemistry, if you have a lot on one side, it pushes that reaction the other direction, right? And that's exactly what happens here. The more CO2 you have, the more the, the push is this way. So CO2 becomes a hydrogen ion. That's going to make an increase in pH. And then you get a bicarbonate too. Um, so it's directly related to this equation of uh, the carbonic acid equation. And like I say at the bottom, this is one of these critical to understand things. Why critical? Because this component of acid-base balance is the, the largest component, at least in the minute to minute or hour to hour. Okay, so your pH right now is pretty much determined by how effectively 
you're getting rid of the CO2 that you're producing. You know, yes, you're making other kinds of acids, but compared to the amount of CO2 you're making, it's minuscule. All right, so um, pH and respiratory system are sort of heavily linked because of this uh, relationship. Okay. So you all said you've heard about buffers, so this ought to be easy. Okay, so what's a buffer system? It's a system of molecules that can absorb or release a hydrogen ion in different situations. Okay, so this is the classic model. We have HY, right? And you put the HY in water, and it dissociates into H plus and Y minus. But not all of it does. Okay, so some of it stays as HY, some of it stays as H plus plus Y minus. Okay, so some buffer system examples using um, this model right here. Okay, so we have HY and H plus and Y minus. Now, I'm going to throw some numbers in here just so you can see how this works. Let's say in a particular state, you've got three of these and you've got um, three of these and three of these, okay? So now we're going to add an H plus. So you've got a cell and it produced acid. So we'll add one H plus. How will this change? Well, because this is a buffer, it's just as happy to be like this as it is to be like this, okay? So if we add an H plus to this system, we get four of these, three of these, and two of those. Okay, so what happened? The H plus bound with one of these and became an HY. Does everybody see that? Right? So we added an acid, but we didn't get a change in pH. This is what a buffer does, and this is the important bit of what it does in the body. So remember, it's the hydrogen ions that create pH. So now we can do this again. So let's add another. So add one H plus here. Now we'll get five of these, three of these still, but now we just have one Y minus left, right? You always have to conserve the atoms. We can't invent Y minuses just because we have acid around. So we've added another H plus, it bound with one of these Y minuses to make an HY. Note again, the pH has not changed. This is what makes buffers cool, is they can absorb hydrogen ions. All right? So now we'll challenge the system. We'll add two H pluses. Okay? So the first H plus you add, what happens? Yes, you're going to have, you're going to use up that Y minus, and you're going to get six HYs. Okay, but we added two, so where does the other one go? Right, it can't go anywhere. You're out of Y minuses. So, we have now four H pluses. So what happened? We ran out of buffer, right? We added acid, the, we had less buffer here, we added a little too much, and now our pH went up. Do you see that? So just like everything else in the universe, there's a limit to how much a buffer, how much acid a buffer can hide from the pH. And this happens in the body too. You know, if you dump a bunch of acid in, well, the buffers are going to get overwhelmed, and there's going to be nothing to hide that hydrogen ion from, uh, from the uh, pH. And you'll actually see an increase in pH. We went from three to four. And if you do this in the laboratory, what you see, you know, so you've got a beaker and it's got a bunch of buffer in it, right? You add a little pink stuff that's going to change color when it goes from acid to, or from um, neutral to acid, right? And you add some acid and you stir it and nothing happens. You add some acid and stir it and nothing happens. At some point, you're going to add a drop of acid and it's going to change color. Why? Because you ran out of buffer, okay? And this is, we see this happen in the body. Um, in uh, respiratory collapse. So patients can tolerate increased acid up until they run out of buffer. 
And then their pH, which has been slowly decreasing, goes boom, and it starts to drop dramatically because they're out of buffer. And those are, that's the conditions where people start to die. Can you all see that over there? I see it looking around the screen. Okay. Um, so I just this is I pretty much said the same thing here that I did here. So we can add. You can also go in reverse here. So let's say we pull an H plus away. Well, one of the HYs dissociates to replace that original one. So these go this way or this way, um, as well as back and forth. All right, but you all know all about buffers, so that's probably ultra simple compared to how you think of it, right? Okay, so what are the buffers in the body? We have um, buffers inside of cells and buffers outside of cells, okay? The intracellular fluid buffers, the principal ones are phosphate and protein, okay? Phosphate, you know, is PO4. Right? It's a phosphorus atom with four oxygens attached. And it has a negative charge, which means it can hold a hydrogen ion and serve as a buffer. Most um, molecules that have a negative charge can hold one or more hydrogen ions in the solution. There's always a ton of phosphate in the intracellular fluid. Remember adenosine triphosphate? Okay, that means phosphate's readily present. That's why the body uses it to store up energy. So we have that one. <clears throat> phosphate also plays a major role in the urine. We get it plenty of phosphate in our diet, which means we have plenty of phosphate to get rid of. So there's always phosphate in the urine, and it does the same thing it does inside of cells. It helps to buffer pH changes. We also have proteins in the cells. Um, proteins make great buffers, some proteins more than others. Um, because remember that a protein is a long chain of amino acids, right? Many of you are in organic chemistry or have had organic chemistry. You know that each amino acid has a different Y group or an R group, right? So different molecules. Many of those R groups have negative charges or regions that can hold hydrogen ions. So some proteins can hold thousands and thousands of hydrogen ions in just one molecule. So proteins can be a very, very effective buffer. Hemoglobin is particularly good at this um, because it's a large protein and it has lots of spots for hydrogen ions to be held in place. Amino acids, even outside of buffers, or even outside of proteins, amino acids can serve as buffers. And then in the plasma, now we're moving into the extracellular fluid, the proteins in the plasma work just like hemoglobin does and help to buffer um, uh, pH changes there too. And then finally, in the extracellular fluid is where we have that buffer system, the carbonic acid uh, buffer. So given this, right, H's and Y's, here Y is HCO3 minus. Right? So do you see how it's the, it, it looks the same? You know, we have this, this is HY, okay? And this is H plus Y. Same pattern. Okay, so the bicarbonate is your Y minus molecule. So like in my example there where we ran out of buffer, where a patient's pH really starts to plummet is when they run out of bicarbonate, right? When they have no more bicarbonate to absorb the acid they're producing, now their pH is going to start to go way, way down because their hydrogen ion concentration is going to go way up, okay? So, um, in the very sick patient, like in the ICU, we will routinely follow their bicarbonate levels because when the bicarbonate gets really, really low, you know that that patient's going to turn the corner and crash on you. So, um, it's one of the ways that we manage our very sickest patients. And I totally agree with the book here that um, the, this buffer system is the most important in the extracellular fluid. It's also one of the most important in the body because it's variable, right? We don't have to get rid of this because we can get rid of CO2 instead. So we have this trick in the lungs that we can take this acid, the HY, and we can get rid of it. We can dump it. So we can take a bicarbonate, add a hydrogen ion to it, and then get rid of that CO2 and the acid goes away with it. It becomes a water. So it's an effective way of getting rid of um, excess hydrogen ions. 
Okay, so just some pictures to show you. Okay, so here's that hemoglobin buffer. <clears throat> the CO2 gets joined with water. We get carbonic acid, HCO3. And then where does that hydrogen ion go? Well, it attaches to hemoglobin, right? And then in the lungs, this system reverses, and we get a CO2 out. So this is right from the respiratory system chapter that we talked about. Okay, just to remind you of the, um, how these two are sort of integrated. Okay. <clears throat> Some other examples of how proteins make good buffers. Um, our groups oftentimes can hold one or more hydrogen ions. The amino group itself, this guy here, because of the charge, this develops a little bit of a negative charge here, so the hydrogen ion can attach there. And then over here on the carboxyl group part, that's a carboxyl group, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not a chemist. Everybody knows that. Um, over here, this O minus can also hold on to a hydrogen ion. So one amino acid has buffered three hydrogen ions, right? So that's a pretty effective buffer. Now, take a few thousand amino acids and string them all together. You lose this and this, but you still have a bunch of R groups that are doing um, a good job at holding hydrogen ions and keeping the pH from changing, like we see here. All right. And then the carbonic acid buffer system we already saw. So one way to think of it's the same system that we talked about in the respiratory system, where CO2 is made by the cells, it becomes bicarbonate, travels to the lungs, and then it goes backwards. But another way of looking at this same chemical equation is as a buffer system. So the body makes hydrogen ions all the time. And as it makes them, those feed into this equation. There's always bicarbonate around if you're healthy anyway and breathing properly. Um, so the, the bicarbonate joins with that hydrogen ion and is both are removed through the lungs as CO2. So for every car bicarbonate ion we have, we can get rid of one hydrogen ion for good. Not just buffer it, not just keep it away, but actually remove it, turn it into a water which has no effect on the pH. Right? So where does the bicarbonate come from? Well, the body always maintains a reserve of bicarbonate. And instead of carbonic acid, where we have an H here, we have sodium bicarbonate. This is baking soda, right? Same stuff you can buy in the store. Well, we maintain a supply of sodium bicarbonate, which is always in its dissociated form of bicarbonate and sodium at least as long as our kidneys are healthy. So as our kidneys secrete hydrogen ions into the urine, urine is usually very acidic, um, it creates a bicarbonate, which can then absorb another hydrogen ion somewhere else, become a CO2, and we get rid of two hydrogen ions for, for one effect, which we'll talk more about uh, next time. All right. So I think we'll stop right there. Here, we'll do a question, because we have time. So the primary role of the, that's this fancy name for that, carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system, right? H-Y, carbonic acid, bicarbonate is the Y, is to do which of those things? Keep looking. What did you say? D or E? D, yes, D. It's to buffer the other kinds of acids. It doesn't make sense for the volatile acids can't buffer themselves. One of the things you've got to keep straight in chemistry where there's multiple buffers, no buffer can buffer itself. Otherwise, you're thinking it's going to get all screwed up because you're going to be in a circular reasoning loop. So if, if the volatile acid can't buffer itself, it can buffer the other two, the organic acids and the fixed acids. Okay, good. One more. Yeah. So a chemical that minimizes changes in the pH by releasing or binding a hydrogen ion is called a good a buffer. Yes. Hopefully you're going to do a buffer lab in lab um, uh, 